गुड मॉर्निंग वन एंड ऑल आई हिमांशु एन सिंह एंड शिखर दयाल ऑफ एस सी आर ए टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन बैच आर गोइंग टू गिव यूर प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन ल्यूब ऑयल सिस्टम फ्यूल ऑयल सिस्टम एंड वाटर कूलिंग सिस्टम ल्यूब ऑयल सिस्टम इज यूज टू लुब्रिकेट एंड कूल द वेरियस कॉम्पोनेट्स लाइक क्रेंक शाफ्ट कैम शाफ्ट कनेक्टिंग रोड पिस्टन एक्सेट्रा The lube oil system consists of lube oil sump, a pump, relief valve, bypass valve, filter assembly, a regulating valve, a lube oil cooler, a strainer, a main header, and two secondary headers, and a heat exchanger in which water acts as a heat exchanger. The lubricating oil pump mounted on the free end of the engine draws the lubricating oil from the engine sump and discharges it it into the system. The relief valve at the end of the discharge side of the pump protects the pump from high pressure and controls the discharge pressure at 135 to 140 psi by passing a portion of oil back to the sump. And from here, the remainder of the oil flows through the filter, which is equipped with a differential pressure bypass valve to hold a relatively constant pressure across the filter. From the filter, the oil flows. goes on through the cooler which acts like a heat exchanger and then to the regulating valve and then to the strainer and from here the strainer separates the bubbles and the uh, impurities in the lubricating oil and sends the lube oil to the main header and from the main header the lube oil goes to the secondary headers from where it is sent to the other cam gears and from the main header it goes to the main bearing and uh, connecting rod piston pin piston ground etc For filling the lube oil sump, remove one of the base doors and add oil directly to the sump. If the filter elements are changed, add approximately 30 gallons of lube oil to the filter on locomotives using a 12 cylinder engine and approximately 50 gallons to the filter on locomotives using a 16 cylinder engine to saturate the elements. And to drain the same, open the two filter drain valves, remove the pipe plug from the external drain pipe and drain plug in the base. At the time of an oil change, if necessary, the base skin should be removed and the base washed out and wiped thoroughly with a clean rag. Now coming to the pre-circulation after every major engine overhaul the lubricating oil should be pre-circulated through the system for the four reasons to check visually lubricating oil discharge points to assure that the oil is reaching all the bearing surfaces to provide sufficient oil to the bearing surfaces during the engine starting period while the lubricating oil pump is building up pressure and to provide an opportunity of checking the system for serious leaks now how is it done to pre-circulate the lubricating oil fill the engine crankcase with dlw acceptable lube oil and connect the suction side of the portable oil pump to the drain of the crankcase of oil sump connect the discharge of the portable pump to the priming connection between the engine pump discharge and the filter To remove any foreign material, apply new filter socks and clean strainer. Close the filter drain valves. Remove the main bearing lube oil pipes and install special break-in filters connecting them to the lube oil header but not to the main bearing caps. And fill the crankcase with clean acceptable lube oil and circulate the oil through the system for at least one hour. Also, check for any leaks. The lube oil from the lube oil sump is sent to the crankshaft via S pipe and then to the connecting rod, cam shaft, and piston. The connecting rod has a fine drilled hole from the big end to the small end for transporting oil for lubrication at the small end bearing and piston pin and for cooling of the piston. For the periodic overhauling of lube oil cooler, disconnect all the connections that is oil inlet, oil outlet, water inlet, and water outlet. Unscrew the four mounting bolts and remove, and then place the lube oil cooler in a clean area. Paint a diagonal cross line on the plate pack to ensure that the plates are reassembled in the right order. Clean and lubricate the tightening bolts by applying a thin film of lubricating oil prior to disassembly. This will avoid any possible damage to the threads of the tightening bolt. Inspect and wipe carrying bar's leading surface. Remove bolts in a sequence by removing always the farthest distance bolt from the midpoint. Now coming to the replacing of gaskets. When a gasket requires replacement, following steps are to be followed for removing the gasket from the plate. Remove the plate from the frame and lay it on a clean flat horizontal surface. Examine and note exactly how the gasket is positioned, particularly what grooves the gasket does and does not occupy. By inserting the screw driver, take up the gasket and by pulling it slowly, remove the whole gasket. Take care not to scratch the plates with the tool. If the gasket is not removed easily by the above method, then immerse the plate assemblies in a 10 to 15 percent caustic bath solution at 140 to 180 degree Fahrenheit for approximately 8 hours. The caustic will soften the glue, and the gaskets can be removed easily. 
Now cleaning of gasket grooves. Clean the gasket groove by nylon brush with soda ash or solution of water and synthetic detergent or use any solvent such as acetone. Also check for any blockages of lubel piping and water piping in case the lubel is getting heated up instead of getting cooled. The lubricating problems we may encounter are dilution by water. Discoloration of the lubricating oil to a grey brown or milky color is an evidence of water in the oil. Any thickening or emulsifying of the oil is more evidence of water. Possibly source of water in the oil may be traced back to a defective water seal in the water pump, cracked liner on cylinder head, defective liner or damaged tubes in the lubricating oil cooler. Never operate an engine if the presence of water in the oil is detected. And the fuel presence. The presence of fuel in the lubricating oil can be detected by a gradual rise in the lubricating oil level during operation, a definite fuel odor in the lubricating oil. Possible sources of fuel oil in the lubricating oil may be traced back to a defective nozzle and its connected piping. Never operate an engine when the percentage of fuel dilution reaches or exceeds 5%. Now, the another problem we may encounter is low lubricating oil pressure. This may be caused by a low oil, low oil level, broken or leakage oil line, inoperative pressure regulating well, clogged filters, defective pump, low viscosity oil, plugged cooler or idling speed when idling speed is too low. And sometimes we may also encounter that the excessive oil consumption, this may be caused by an oil leak, worn, broken or stuck piston rings, broken or stuck or clogged oil control rings, clogged drain holes in piston or an improper grade of oil. Now coming to the fuel oil system. The fuel oil is the basic resource of power of the diesel engine. As such, the efficiency of the diesel engine depends upon mostly upon the quality of the fuel and the pattern of the fuel injected into the cylinder. The fuel oil system is designed to introduce fuel into the engine cylinders at the correct time, in the correct quantity and the correct pressure. The fuel oil system consists of two integrated systems. The first, the fuel feed system. The fuel feed system provides the backup support to the fuel injection pump by maintaining steady supply of fuel at the required pressure and another fuel injection pump. The fuel injection pump started according to the firing order. All FIP start and discharge fuel at high pressure according to the respective nozzle. They are also responsible for the atomization of the fuel. Fuel oil and its properties. High speed diesel oil is used as a fuel in the diesel locomotive. High speed diesel oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons comprising of paraffins, olefins, naphthenes, and aromatics, having boiling range from 500 to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Additives may also be used to improve the performance of fuel and ignition quality of the fuel. Now, the properties on which diesel oil fuel depends are combustion characteristics like CTL number, diesel index, volatility, and some other factors like stability, viscosity, specific gravity, ash content, and the carbon residue. Fuel feed system consists of fuel oil tank, fuel primary filter, relief valve, secondary filter and regulating valve. And the fuel injection system consists of fuel injection pump and fuel injection nozzle. Now coming to the working of fuel oil system, the fuel booster pump or the transform pump is switched on and the pump starts sucking oil from the fuel tank which is filtered through the primary filter. Because of variable consumption by the engine, the delivery pressure of the pump may arise increasing load on the pump and its drive motor. When the rate of consumption of the fuel by the engine is low, the relief valve ensures that the safety of components is maintained by releasing load bypassing the excess pressure back to the tank and the oil passes through the paper type secondary filter and proceeds to the right side of the fuel header. The fuel header is connected to the 8 numbers of fuel injection pumps on the right tank of the engine. The steady oil supply is maintained to the pumps at a pressure of 3 kg per square centimeter. Then the fuel passes to the left side of the header and reaches the 8 fuel injection pumps on the left bank through the jumper pipes. The regulating valve remaining after the left side of the fuel header takes care of excess pressure over 3 kg per square centimeter and by passing the extra oil back to the tank. And from here, a coach connection is taken from here leading to the driver's cabin for indicating the pressure of the fuel oil. Thus, the fuel oil speed system keeps fuel continuously available to the fuel injection pumps, which the pumps may use or refuse depending on the demand of the engine. 
Each fuel injection pump is subjected to test and calibration after repair or overhaul to ensure that they deliver the same and stipulated amount of fuel at a particular rack position. Every pump must deliver regulated and equal quantity of fuel at the same time so that the engine output is optimum and at the same time running is smooth with minimum vibration. The calibration and testing of fuel pumps are done on a specific, specially designed machine. The machine has a 5 horsepower reversible motor to drive a camshaft through V belt. The blended test oil of the recommended viscosity under controlled temperature is circulated through a pump at a specified pressure for feeding the pump under test. It is very much necessary to follow the laid down standard procedure of testing to obtain the standard test results. The pump under test is fixed on the top of the cam box and its rack set at a particular position to find out the quantum of fuel delivery at that position. The machine is then switched on and the cam starts making delivery strokes. A revolution counter attached to it set to trip at 300 rpm or 100 rpm as required. With the cam making strokes, if the pump delivers any oil, it returns back to the reservoir in normal state. Thus, the oil discharge at 300 working strokes of the pump is measured, which should be normally within the stipulated limit. The criteria for good nozzle is good atomization, correct spray pattern, and no leakage or dribbling. So, the spray of fuel should take place through all the holes uniformly and properly atomized, while the atomization can be seen through the glass jar and impression taken on a sheet of blotting paper at a distance of half inch should also give a clear impression of the spray pattern. It must be in the form of a lotus. The stipulated crack pressure at which the spray should take place 3900 to 4050 psi for new and 3700 to 3800 psi for reconditioned nozzles. If the pressure is down to 3600 psi, the nozzle needs replacement. The spray pressure is indicated in the gauge provided at the test machine. Now coming to the dribbling, there should be no loose drops of fuel coming out of the nozzle before or alter the injections. The process of checking dribbling during testing is by having injections manually done couple of times quickly and check the nozzle tip whether leaky. Now coming to the nozzle chatter. The chattering sound is a sort of cracking noise created due to the free movement of the nozzle valve inside the valve body. If it is not proper, then the chances are that the valve is not moving freely inside the nozzle. Now, a very minute portion of the oil inside the nozzle passes clearance between the valve and the valve body for the purpose of lubrication. Excess clearance between them may cause the excess leak off, thus reducing the amount of fuel actually injected. Other failures which may occur is the oil leakage from fuel T jumper, the choked filters like primary or secondary, and the damaging of fuel oil hose pipes. Now, moving on to water cooling system. After combustion of fuel in the engine, about 25 to 30% of heat produced inside the cylinder is absorbed by the components surrounding the combustion chamber like piston cylinder, cylinder head, etc. Unless the heat is taken away from there and dispersed elsewhere, the components are likely to fail under thermostresses. All internal combustion engines are provided with a cooling system designed to cool the excessively hot components, distribute the heat to the other surrounding components to maintain uniform temperature throughout the engine, and finally dissipate the excess heat to the atmosphere to keep the engine temperature within suitable limits. Different cooling systems like air cooling, water cooling are adopted depending on the engine design, working conditions and service etc. The advantage of having a water cooling system is that it maintains a uniform level of temperature throughout the engine and by controlling the water temperature, the engine temperature can be controlled effectively. The engine in each locomotive unit has an individual cooling water system. Water is circulated by a centrifugal pump, air driven from the crankshaft. Water flows from the pump through headers into the right and left banks of the engine block where the water circulates around the cylinder line. Water also flows from the pump to the turbo supercharger and the after cooler. Cooling water from the engine block rises into the cylinder head and flows out to risers which are connected to water outlet headers running along the top of the engine. Water then flows to the radiator and expansion tank. Cooled water from the radiator flow to the oil cooler and finally returns to the water pump. The cooling system is a closed one with the expression tank vented to atmosphere through an overflow pipe. To rid the system of air and gases on all locomotive units, vent pipes are connected to air collecting domes and lead to the expansion tank. The radiators are also vented. Although natural water can meet the basic requirement, its use is prohibited for the cooling of the engine because it contains many dissolved solids and corrosive elements. 
some of the dissolved solids may form scales on the heat exchanger surface and reduce the heat transfer coefficient it also accelerates corrosion water is changed if hardness and chloride is higher than the recommended limit and therefore fresh distilled water with chromate mixture is filled in the locomotive the various components of the water cooling system are water header radiator panel radiator fan expansion tank after cooler and turbo supercharger radiators shall be blown from both sides in every schedule new boil coolers shall be taken out and cleaned in yearly schedule sealing of radiator doors to be ensured to prevent drawing of air various tests related to water cooling system are dye penetration test it is a test to find cracks in the different components like water pumps radiator fans etc here first the surface of the component is cleaned and then red dye penetrate is sprayed over the surface after the developers is sprayed over the surface the region where the, there is crack it turns white this is how the cracks become visible hardness test in the shed dropwell and wickers hardness test machines are present where hardness numbers of various components are set and compared with standard values magna flux test it is a test for determining cracks in the components made up of magnetic material a component is put into magnetic field and then iron powder with kerosene is sprayed over it the region where the iron powder gets sent indicates the presence of crack the study and analysis of the lubol system furol system and water cooling system was carried under the guidance of mr mithilesh kumar gautam senior section engineer pipe section jamalpur workshop and the powerpoint presentation of the same wouldn't have been possible without the untiring teaching efforts of our respected professor wmt mr kuldeep singh and, and thank, thank you, you for, for a valuable, valuable time, time.